out to contact angels, your guides, guardians, and friends. Why should we contact angels? Simply because they are our guides, guardians, and friends, and simply because God created angels to help us, to minister unto us, and to do many wonderful things for us. I was interested to read the story in the March 1992 issue of Life magazine, which told of how angels brought comfort to one family. Dr. Diane Comp, an oncologist and professor of pediatrics from Yale University, sat with a family at the bedside of their seven-year-old daughter. She was dying of leukemia. In her final moments, she suddenly sat up summoned with strength and said, Mommy, can you see them? Do you hear their singing? I've never heard such beautiful singing. Whereupon the child laid down and breathed her last breath. Dr. Comp said that the only thing that she could describe as to what she felt was summed up in the word gift. The angels had given a gift to the parents, bringing comfort to them that there was something more, something more than they could see, and that their daughter was in good hands. And so they could truly understand the grieving and then the letting go of her passing. They could never forget that the angels were waiting to receive their daughter in heaven. But would they know that those same angels would be preparing her soul to return to earth sometime in a future embodiment? The word angel comes from the Latin angelus, meaning messenger. Angels are God's messengers sent to us. They are divine spirits. They are heralds of the Son of God and they go before him to proclaim his day. So who are the angels? Who are you? Who am I? The author of Hebrews tells us a mystery which I would like to unveil this evening. No one is quite sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. I have even wondered if our Lord wrote it himself because it is so mystical and so profound and it tells us things about Jesus that no other scripture tells us. And so the book begins with these words, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers and the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. The author of Hebrews is explaining to us the hierarchy of heaven, of the angels, of the Son of God, and of the sons and daughters of God. We are beginning to understand what our lawful place is in relationship to God, his Son, and his angels. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee? And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Now we know that the angels of God worship the living Christ, the Son of God. And of the angels God said, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. So angels are spirits of God. They are ministers who minister unto us. They are ministering servants. 
but they are made of a flame of fire. So now we know that the nature of angels is something different from our own nature. They are made of the fire of God itself. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens and the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits? Send forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. We then are the heirs of the salvation of Jesus Christ. And we know that God has sent his emissaries, his ministering servants, his angels, to assist us in the very day-to-day -day process of our salvation. So now we know why we should get to know angels, why we shall, should interact with them, because God has ordained them unto the glorification of his Son in our body and in our members. I would like to speak to you about the Son of God and the living Christ, and so I would show you the chart of the presence. This is the basic teaching that our beloved Jesus Christ and beloved Saint Germain have given to us. The chart of the presence is a picture of you. When we ask the question, who am I? The chart answers that question. I am a child of God. I am a son or a daughter of God. I am shown as I am now as the lowest figure in the chart, the individual, who is invoking the Holy Spirit. And God responds and sends that Holy Spirit as the gift of the violet flame. And so you can see yourself in this chart as that lower figure, praising God for his angels, praising God for his Holy Spirit, and celebrating this greatest of gifts, the violet forgiveness flame, the violet transmuting flame. Where does the Son of God appear in the chart? The Son of God is the middle figure. The middle figure in the chart is the only begotten Son of God, who is the universal Christ. That universal Christ was fully embodied in the incarnate word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet he came to show us a path, and he left footprints in the sands that we might follow. The great division between the schools of Gnosticism of the early church and the Roman and Eastern Orthodox churches falls upon whether we worship Jesus as the only flesh and blood God and Son of God, or we discover that the word Christ is from the Greek Christos, meaning anointed with light, and that same light wherewith God has anointed us, he has also anointed Jesus the same light of that Christ in Jesus, is now a potential, a divine spark, a threefold flame within us. As we look at the whole chart now, we see that Christ is the mediator between the lower self that is fallen into a state of karma, which the world would call a state of sin. The upper figure in the chart represents the I am that I am who appeared to Moses, the mighty angel of the Lord who declared him, I am that I am. This is my name forever and my memorial to all generations. I am that I am is a statement of being. It is a statement of God's presence with us. That presence of God never leaves us, though we ourselves may leave that presence by being out of harmony, 
out of alignment with that presence and the laws of God. Habakkuk speaks of the presence when he said, Mine eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. Because God is perfection and the absolute, and the I am that I am is the first manifestation of what the Kabbalah calls Ein Sof, the unmanifest God. So we see the manifest God is that perfection. We are imperfect, and so we do not have that opportunity to see God face to face. Who sees God face to face is the Son of God, the living Christ. The key to the mystery of the incarnation of Jesus Christ is also given in the book of Hebrews, and I will get to that in a moment. Hebrews speaks of the high priest, the high priest and Jesus Christ himself being the high priest. I would like to read you these verses from Hebrews concerning Jesus' priesthood in our lives. Hebrews 5 says, Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And so we are speaking now of Jesus in the human sense of the word, of his suffering, of his being persecuted and crucified, and how through all of that trial and testing he demonstrated the path of the obedient son, the obedient daughter of God. And being made perfect, the soul of Jesus being made perfect in the living Christ, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Nowhere else in the New Testament do we have this statement that Jesus is called the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the author of Hebrews had some inside information, and of course who was most likely to have that information was Jesus himself. Perhaps he gave it to a close disciple, or perhaps it came down through tradition. But Hebrews is a profound mystery that you ought to study. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Jesus is here, or his spokesman in the book of Hebrews is here, explaining to us that there is a religion that is the milk of the word, that is fed to babes. But then there are those who mature and ripen into oneness with the living Christ. They can hear the strong meat. They have the power to exorcise unclean spirits and they have the power of discernment, all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, to know both good and evil. So it is the strong meat of the word that is often left out of the sermons that we hear from the pulpits today, lest it offend some, bore others, and totally confuse others still. Today we are receiving from our pulpits only the milk, but who is ready for the meat? If you are ready for the meat of the word, then you must be ready to follow in the footsteps of Jesus all the way to Golgotha, to the resurrection and the ascension, and to be willing to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul said. 
Why am I discussing these things with you? I am talking about this because I want to talk to you about angels. I want to talk to you about your soul who has descended to the lower figure in the chart. And I want to talk to you about the Savior who is the universal Christ and the individual Christ. There is only one Christ and that Christ is the universal and only begotten Son of God. And yet unto each one of us God has given a portion of that Christ and that portion is our individual portion. It is called the divine spark or the threefold flame. That portion that we receive of the living Christ is enough whereby we through our words and our works, our devotion and our pure love and our seeking to balance our karma and receive the graces and gifts of God might ultimately know the fullness of that Christ also manifesting bodily in us as that Christ manifested bodily in Jesus Christ. This is the parting of the way between the ancient Gnostics and the fully established and entrenched Roman Church who at the time determined not that the individual might seek and find his God through the living presence of the I am that I am and the Christ self above him but only through a structure of hierarchy of mortal men. Curiously the scriptures do not say anywhere that we need go through any man to reach God or reach our Lord Jesus Christ, nor any hierarchy, nor any set of dogma or doctrine except the great doctrine that he preached, the doctrine of divine love and of obedience to the Father and the Son. What I bring to you is what Jesus brought to the disciples, what was written down by early Christians who preferred to walk in the footsteps of Jesus than to walk in the shadow cast against the figure upon the hill, the great figure of our Lord. It is the teaching that Jesus gave. If you become like me, you shall be as I am. You shall be my twin. This is said in the Gospel of Thomas, which I will be teaching to you this weekend. And it is a glorious gospel indeed. It is highly controversial today because the arguments surrounding this gospel have to do with whether it was written before the four gospels of the canon or afterwards. And where it is positioned has a lot to do with the future of theology in Christianity in this century and the next. The teaching of Jesus was not that he had a physical twin born at the same time that he did. Scholars agree on this, that that was not the case at all. The concept of the twin is that when you drink from the same fount from which I have drunk, as Jesus said, you shall be like me and I will be like you. You will be my twin. How can we be the twin of Jesus? This is how. It is because the same Christ the same light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And that is the phrase with, with which John opens his book, his gospel. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This light, this Christos, this image and likeness of God is present for each one of us. It is the likeness of our real self and our true self. And so this chart is a humble attempt to depict that relationship that as the mediator between God and man we have that person whom Jeremiah foresaw. He foresaw the coming day of the Lord our righteousness, the Lord within us who would teach us the right use of God's laws and right from wrong and good from evil, not merely in the relative sense of the word but in the absolute sense of Christ and Antichrist. So what is the teaching that is so key here? It is that we can receive the angels because we have an high priest who is Jesus Christ and that Christ presence of Jesus is with us and officiates at the altar of our heart, the heart of knowledge, the heart of gnosis, the heart of self-knowledge in God. 
of knowing one's inner self to be truly God, even as it is taught in Hinduism that the Atman dwells in every man, woman, and child. It is the likeness of Brahman. Because we have that portion within us, and it is not the exclusive ownership of Jesus, we therefore can also attain to the likeness of the Son of God and become a twin of Jesus. I am certain that you realize that speaking these words would be considered blasphemous in many circles today. And that is because we have listened to the tried and true story, the old, 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 old story told again and again and again of Jesus and his love that we do not any longer read with objectivity the meager scriptures we do have. And of course, the Gnostic Gospels that have been around for about 40 years since their discovery at Nag Hammadi have been summarily denounced by Orthodox Christianity. And so they are studied in the universities, they are read outside of the churches, and people all over the world are discovering that what they have felt and known and been concerned about and questioned in terms of the doctrines of the church are now confirmed by the fragments that were left and not burned by the mother of the peasant who uh, burned them and therefore we have but about half of those that were hid in the earthen jar. So in the sense of the word that we are speaking, we have the Christ presence with us. In order to attain reunion with God, the I am that I am, the soul encased in flesh in these bodies at this level of our karma and our evolution must reach for that high calling in God, which is in Christ Jesus. We must reach for the Christ of our own being and realize that God sent us to become and fully realize that Christ. This is our understanding. This is our joy and path. It is also, I believe, the teaching of the scriptures if we read them independently of the burdens of orthodox interpretation. So God who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire created angels before he created us. Why? So that when he created us, we would have caretakers. We would have someone to care for us. He fashioned angels out of his own flaming presence, his own flaming spirit. Therefore, when we consider angels and we consider our presence, we can understand that that Holy Christ presence has many times been called the guardian angel. People think of the guardian angel as just another angel, but the true guardian presence of our life is Christ the Lord personified in the one whom we address as the Holy Christ self. We are liberated then from the sense that we will forevermore be sinners, cast in a mold of flesh and original sin, that we can truly rise to that stature of the fullness of Christ because God ordained it, and not only did he ordain it, but he sent us angels to preach to us, to heal us, to care for us, to enlighten us, to move us to the understanding that God would never send us forth into these lower levels of our karma without himself going along. God came along with us to this world in the person of that Holy Christ self, in the person of the I Am Presence. Understanding this, we move forward on the foundation as to why it is so important that we not only enlist the help of angels, but that we exercise the authority of the Son of God that is within us and in the name of the I am that I am, we command these legions of angels to go forth, to stop war, to rescue life, to find and give us the cure for AIDS, to deal and tackle with all problems in our society, in our schools, in our families, in our homes, in ourselves, in our own psychology. We can call upon angels to do anything. And if we call with love and according, to the will of God and his laws, they will never ever fail to answer us. 
The booklet you have on angels contains prayers, decrees, songs, fiats to the angels, and we're going to be using them throughout this class. So now I will get on with my message to you about angels. Angels are flames of living fire, sacred fire. Sacred fire of God is not hot, it is cool, except when it touches discord or misqualified energy. When you come into the aura of an angel or he comes into your aura, he will not leave you as he has found you. And so by his very living flaming presence, you may feel the alchemy of transmutation, of the consuming of old stubbornness and pride. It is a humbling experience, profoundly humbling. Angels are extensions of God's presence, and they manifest in a form that we can recognize. They are ministering servants. They tend our spirits, our minds, our souls, our bodies. They are sent by God as messengers to deliver his word. They have a multitude of functions. They protect us, they guide us, strengthen us, heal us, comfort us, teach us, counsel us, and they warn us. I perceive that angels are angles of God's consciousness. God is infinite. We cannot know him in mortal consciousness. But angels can reveal various sides of God's nature, angles of God, that we would not perceive on our own. They are like our second sight. They are like looking through the all-seeing eye of God at God himself without God quite knowing that we are watching him. They come in at every point and angle and vector of the universe to deliver their light to our bodies. They give us a literal transfusion to our organs, to every part of us, but the key is we must welcome them, we must call upon them. This is the contract, or if you will, the covenant that God, our Father, Mother, made with us when we left out of that glorious presence and gradually descended into the veils of illusion, of imperfection, and of forgetfulness of his laws and therefore disobedience to his laws. God said to us very lovingly, you have gone out of our presence, you have chosen to be in lesser octaves, lower vibrations, you have chosen to have your own way and to do things your way. You have chosen to exercise the gift I have given to you of free will. But you have chosen not to exercise it, to always choose the will of God, but rather to manifest your own willfulness. So here is what we're going to do. We, your father, mother, are going to give you this vast matter universe for exploration, discovery, and specifically, we're assigning you to planet Earth. And you can do anything you want to do. Of course, there is the law of karma. As a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can learn the consequences of your actions that are not in keeping with our laws. We will not interfere. We will not interfere with anything at all. We give you totally free reign. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 1-800-245-5445. That's 1-800-245-5445. The records of cataclysms, of wars of the gods on the ancient continent of Lemuria or Atlantis, past ages that have no records whatsoever in our history books, attest to the fact that God has been true to his word. He has not interceded when a little child is perhaps burned in a fire. He has not interceded when six million Jews were burned in concentration camps and these were God's chosen people. He has left Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Hindu alike to their own devices and to their subsequent karma. But he has said, if you call to me, if you call upon the Lord, if you 
praise my name. If you ask me to send intercessors in the persons of my angels, I will send them immediately to your side. And according to your karma, according to your situation, you may have complete and ultimate divine intercession or some sort of aid. This is the law and the covenant that God has made with us. So many people in the world are frustrated and sometimes angry. You see the symbol of the clenched fist, which is the symbol of the defiance of Almighty God and His laws. And people are angry with God because He has allowed their child to die or this to happen to them. They have said, this is not our earthquake, this is God's earthquake. This is not our hurricane, this is God's hurricane. But in fact, every erg of energy that we have all sent out, billions of us on planet Earth, that is negative, that is hateful, wrathful, angry, accumulates and multiplies and returns to us in weather conditions, in calamities, in sudden, tremendous challenges that come upon us in our personal lives, our businesses, in our nations, and in the earth. So the reason why there is a delayed reaction of God answering us through his angels is that we have put so many walls of barriers of our karma, of our negative consciousness, of our defiance of God between us and him, that now we have to carve a hole through this very dense wall of protection we have built to protect our human ego and our right to be who we are as somebody important apart from God. By and by, some of us, hopefully most of us, get very tired of this merry-go-round of being our own person and falling on our noses and on our faces, embodiment after embodiment. And we are humbled by God and His presence, by our love for His Son, and we say, I want no more of this. I want to live my life according to the will of God. I want to serve Him. I want to help others find Him. And I'm no longer going to use my free will except in confirmation of God's will. When we decide to turn around and face the Son of God and the Son of our I Am Presence and walk that homeward path, we will have to pick up every step of the way, every step we take, our karma, our mistakes, our unkind words, our arguments, all of those things that are not of God. And we must balance that karma. We do so by invoking the violet flame and by service to life. And the grace of the Son of God is that this process can be accelerated. And so we do not believe that it will take us millions of years and manvantaras to get back to God, but that in fact, by diligence and service, this process can happen in this lifetime or a couple of lifetimes. But we need to take the teachings of Jesus Christ and Saint Germain and apply them because there are things we definitely need to do if we expect to stand in the presence of the Son of God and claim that Son as our real self and be drawn as he was in the ascension to the heart of the I am that I am. And so angels are here to help us find our way back home if that's where we want to go. And if we tell them we want to serve God on earth for many lifetimes, they will be with us on earth for many lifetimes and help us in whatever our calling from God is. Angels have enormous auras of light. And what they do best is to intensify the feelings of God in our beings. Feelings of love and faith and hope, of honor and courage and mercy, every virtue that you can think of that is ennobling, that assists others, that brings us closer to God. Angels will come into your aura when you are in a moment of greatest tragedy and bring comfort and a sense that all is well, even though you are devastated. We are so often supported by angels that we almost take them for granted and do not realize how much worse life could be on earth without their loving presence. Angels sometimes take on human form and then they move among us as our truest friends and helpers. 
The ancient myth of the fall of angels is actually true. And when therefore the good angels who cast them out of heaven under Archangel Michael saw that these fallen angels in the earth went about to make war against the children of God, the good angels said, we will volunteer. We want to go down and take physical embodiment and be born through human mothers so that we can personally walk and talk with people and warn them of the evils of fallen angels who rise to power in the money markets of the world, in the economy, in the governments of the nations and make a mess of them and take the people's light and take the people's money and torment the people with things like drugs and liquor, nicotine, all of the vices that come upon people to take them away from God. We want to go out and preach the word and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom we worship. And so you will find that even your best friend or your greatest confidant or someone close to you was once an angel and began to embody on earth and now has continued to embody in the evolution of the sons and daughters of God. As you know, the Apostle Paul was inspired by angels to say to the rest of the disciples and to the people, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. We're not always aware that someone who is lending a helping hand is an angel in disguise. Archangels are the captains or hierarchs of the angelic hosts. They preside over what are called the seven rays. You can see the seven rays and the seven rings of the great causal body that surrounds the I Am Presence. Those are actually spheres of light. Your I Am Presence and causal body as one is a replica of the spheres of light that surround the spiritual physical center of our spirit and matter cosmos that we cannot even see. It is called the Great Central Sun. And so these spheres of color bands are worlds within worlds. You were created in the beginning in the image of the Father, Mother, God, male and female as twin flames. So you are one half of a divine whole and your other half may be sitting next to you or across on the other side of the earth or across the solar systems. Because of our willfulness and making much karma, we have often separated from our twin flames for thousands of years, which is why we understand and how we understand a certain inner loneliness, a certain sense that we are not with the one that we love most that is the other half of ourself, that we have lost that one somewhere and we must find that one. The poem of Angeline is a story of the search for the twin flame. Twin flames then go forth as individual people, sometimes one is the male, sometimes the other, going forth through all of these spheres of light and finally descending to a level of embodiment, physical embodiment. And so in earlier golden ages, people never descended as low as we are today. They remained in octaves of light and perfection they didn't buy the forbidden fruit of fallen angels or of evil. They resisted the temptations that our forebears and we did not resist. And therefore, they remained in levels of perfection and ascended back to God without ever having made negative karma. These races are called root races, and they are certain bands of souls, perhaps millions, many millions of souls, who go out from the central sun in light epochs and this has been going on as the ages have gone forth and as they have returned again to the central sun so these seven rays denote seven planes of consciousness and the seven archangels occupy each one of them with their divine complement one of those seven rays the divine complement of an archangel is known as an archaea and the plural is archaei Archangels, as I have said, are emanations of God. They are the direct extensions of God. They embody the fullness of the presence of God. 
When we understand that, we can understand the mystery of Exodus, which explains that Moses looked and he saw in the bush that burned but was not consumed an angel of the Lord. And then pretty soon, as it goes on, it is the Lord himself who is speaking to Moses. How did the angel of the Lord become the Lord? I am that I am. It is because an archangel has the stature of being the full presence and embodiment of the living God, of the Almighty One, who is manifest to you in that I am presence. If you visualize the One God as the great central sun, a blazing presence of light, as you understand the unmanifest and manifest God, and you see the rays coming forth from the sun, even if, as you see these rays on the chart, you can see angels as the ray of light. And you can see that a ray of light actually contains all the fullness of God, even as the proverbial drop in the ocean contains all the elements of the sea. So when you stand in the presence of an archangel, you stand in the presence of God. It is awesome. Archangels are architects. They plan and design what is happening in the entire cosmos, age after age. God uses them to draft the plans for his projects and to execute those plans, along with the nature spirits and the manifestation of God as Elohim. Archangels arc God's light to man, to our very heart. They quicken our hearts to convey the divine blueprint. When you know who you are and what you're going to do in life and your course of study, your mission, your profession, your calling, how did you know it? Did you think it up? Well, you might have thought you thunk it up, but in fact, an angel may have arced that light from your I am presence because you are not in exactly the fullest attunement with that I am presence and arced that awareness, that inner knowingness, that sense. This is what I have to do in this life. This experience actually happened to me. I was 18 years old and I was standing on the steps of the Christian Science Church in Red Bank, New Jersey, my hometown. I had just come out of church and I was filled with a light of my meditation upon God. Church to me all of my life was that experience. I couldn't tell what anybody else was doing in their pews, but whenever I got into any church, it really didn't matter which one. I was so filled with a light of God I was simply transported somewhere else. And so I, I came out of church and I looked at the end of the, the large step that came out from the front door. It was like a, a large platform. And I saw this light by a pillar. And as I looked, I realized this was the Archangel Gabriel. And I saw him and I was absolutely astounded and yet not astounded because he surrounded me with his aura and made me feel that it was altogether natural to be seeing an archangel and so I stood there and I felt the power of his mind and I felt him transmit a message to my mind and this transmission was so powerful in broad daylight with all the people pouring out of church I exclaimed out loud in response to the impacting of my mind that I felt. I said, why I have to make my ascension in this life. And then I stood back and I said, what did I just say? No one had ever taught me that anyone else besides Jesus Christ was supposed to make their ascension, to ascend. It was never discussed not in the Orthodox churches I'd been to and not in the metaphysical movement that I was into in Christian science. No one ever said that the ascension was the goal of life and that there was a course of study and footsteps you had to take and things you had to do and debts you had to balance and it just didn't happen automatically as my Christian science teacher told me many years later, well, you don't have to worry about your ascension it just happens automatically. Nothing happens automatically. And definitely not the most important event of your entire existence on planet Earth, the moment of your soul's ultimate and final reunion with God.
The ascension is the goal of your life. And as a matter of fact, it is the Archangel Gabriel who comes to you, whether you are conscious of it or not, comes to your soul and announces to you, this is the lifetime when you can make it. This is the lifetime when, if you do all things well, that door will swing wide and you will attain union with God to go out no more. You will no longer have to return reincarnating lifetime after lifetime to clean up what you did in the last lifetime and 10 and 20, 30 embodiments ago. How many of you have had that intimation from God that this is the lifetime when you should make your ascension? Look at all of you in this room. This is a marvelous show of hands. It's an attestation to the figure of Archangel Gabriel in your life and you should cherish and treasure that and get a picture of Archangel Gabriel, one of the old master's paintings, and keep it somewhere where you say, Hi, Gabriel, every day. Thanks for letting me know. Thanks for telling me. Now I know where I'm going and why I need to be doing what I'm doing, even if it's all, not always the most pleasant task that I, that I could choose. The Archangels help us to balance our karma on each of the seven rays. We make karma specifically on those rays and through the misuse of our chakras. So now I'd like to show you the lower figure in the chart, you as the chakra man or the chakra woman or the chakra child. Will the real chakra man please stand up? That's all right, you can be seated. <laughs> Okay, those chakras show the seven rays and those seven rays correlate to those same color spheres, the same colors that are in your causal body. Each of the archangels assists you in amplifying the light of God in one of those chakras. The archangels send their angels to assist you to balance your misuse of the light of God in one of those chakras. A chakra is a spiritual center. Its purpose is so that God, your I am presence, can step down the light to a certain frequency. Each one of the seven rays from the base to the crown has a different frequency. So as the light of God is stepped down through the chakras, you experience God in a different way in each plane of your being. For instance, you think through the crown chakra, you see through the third eye, you exercise the power of the spoken word through the throat chakra, you experience love in the heart, desire in the solar plexus, the presence of the soul and intuition in the seat of the soul chakra, and the white fire of the Divine Mother in the base chakra, which is the fount of light that rises and is the power of procreation. Archangel Zadkiel teaches us how to balance karma with a violet flame. And that's a very important part of the work we do in this activity. Well, of course, my encounter with Archangel Gabriel, and I'm certain yours also, whether it was conscious or just as an inner knowing, sent me and you on a relentless course. We have determined that we want to know God face to face. The scriptures say that no man can see God's face and live. Who would want to see God's face? Well, Mark Prophet gave me the understanding of that scripture and he said, what it really means and what it really says is, no man can see God and live as man any longer. Because once he has seen God, he will have the imprint of God in his being and in his mind and in his heart. And henceforth, he must live as the God manifestation or the manifestation of God. So you are not going to drop dead if you see the face of your I am presence or your Holy Christ self. But one glimpse of that presence in prayer, in communion with God, and the whole universe changes for you.
you have discovered who you are because that God presence is in truth your reality this wasn't the first time I had experienced angels I remember water skiing on the Navisink River in Red Bank and I was on those skis for the longest time going toward the sea under the bridges it was a beautiful day and somewhere along the way I transcended my physical consciousness and I looked up into the heavens and I simply saw the glory of God I was aware not of thousands but millions of presences of angels and of souls and they were rejoicing they were rejoicing that my time had come and their time had come and we were entering in an age when all of us as a band of wherever we came from were going to be able to make it in this life it was so thrilling I was in the midst of dealing with my karma and all kinds of things that teenagers go through but my days were always filled with attention on God and that was a moment that I will never forget I had many other such moments when I was aware of the throngs of heaven the souls of light who were tending and then the angels too it was not just angels it was souls who were preparing to come into embodiment who had just left embodiment but they were all rejoicing my search for God led me to Mark Prophet in 1961 when I was a student in political science at Boston University I attended a meeting where he spoke he delivered a lecture and then he delivered a dictation from Saint Michael the Archangel I was thrilled beyond words to hear that dictation and also to experience in meditation before it took place as Mark Prophet was able to lift my soul to another dimension and I saw the whole earth and all of the children of the light and the people that I needed to contact they looked like daisies in the field millions of daisies and each one had a face of a soul someone I must go and find someone I must give what a teaching I did not yet know a teaching I would receive it was a brief interlude before the meditation music began for the dictation and I was in rapt attention it was the first time in my life I had ever heard an archangel or an angel speak through a human being it was a powerful message an address to the people of Boston that if you pray to Archangel Michael he will take you to octaves of light at the end of your embodiment he also said people of Boston I am come to cut you free and I knew he was talking to me I was about to be cut free for my mission I was trained by the ascended master El Moria to be a messenger for the angels for the Saints of God and I was trained through Mark Prophet in Washington we were married we had four children and he passed on as he said he would he prophesied his own passing he stayed with me a little bit longer than he said he would it was 12 years during those years and the years which followed the two of us have taken hundreds of dictations from archangels and angels of God all of these are in our files and many of them are published I'm going to quote from some of these dictations some of the very special messages that the angels have given us for all of you I'd like to show you Saint Michael the Archangel probably one of the angels most familiar to you he serves on the first ray the ray of God's holy will and of power it's a ray of perfection, protection, faith, and God's government in the earth. This is a Tiffany painting of Archangel Michael. It's one of my favorite ones. And it's on the cover of our compact disc and cassette of a collection of songs that we sing to Archangel Michael. 
He is the angel of power and of empowerment. He wields tremendous energy, and his legions of light wield that power in your defense. When you begin on the path homeward to God, that is when the fallen angels take note of you and will begin to move against you. So we have two 90-minute cassettes, an Archangel Michael Rosary and an Archangel Michael Song and Decree cassette, so that you can immediately begin to call to Archangel Michael for the protection of your soul on the path of your union with God. For more information on how angels can make a difference in your life, call toll-free 1-800-245-5445. The preceding program was presented by Summit University, Box 5000, Livingston, Montana, 59047-5000. If you'd like to know more, call this number or write this address. For your free copy of Elizabeth Clare Prophet's best-selling book, The Human Aura, call this toll-free number, 1-800-245-5445. This is a limited-time offer, so call now for your free book. That's 1-800-245-5445.